Done. Oh, perfect. Oops. Oops if I don't close that. All right, welcome everyone to the April meeting of the PowerShell Virtual Chapter of PASS. My name is Aaron Nelson, and I'm going to walk you through a couple things before we get started with today's session. Today's session is PowerShell Tips and Tricks by Mike Fowl, and we'll get back to that in just a minute. Uh, before we get there, I wanted to let you know we've got a uh, discount code. Uh, they give us a slide that says Business Analytics Conference, which is next week. Uh, but I think this code is actually for the PASS Summit. So if you're looking to sign up for PASS Summit, this would be a great code to use. Um, saves you $150 off registration. And uh, if we get 10 people to sign up, then we get swag for the PowerShell Virtual Chapter to give away at a meeting in the future. So there's that. It's the VC15MBK7, and I think it's including the asterisk. So, uh, there's a ton of virtual chapters out there, so if, uh, if you like what you see here and you think one of these other categories might interest you, I definitely invite you to go check that out. So, so far this year we've been meeting mostly on Fridays and next month, the Friday of the month, the third Friday of the month would be the day that we're getting ready for SQL Saturday Atlanta, uh, or at least I will be. So I'll be pretty busy. So we went ahead and bumped those sessions forward a day and we're actually going to do two sessions that day. We're, both sessions are going to be presented by PowerShell MVPs. Uh, the first session is going to be at 11 a.m. Eastern Time. Uh, so just an hour earlier, and it's uh, UTC minus four, in case you didn't know, but if you're here, you probably did. Uh, then the next session is going to be by Chrissy Lemaire, also a PowerShell MVP, and I've been using her script for copying uh, logins from one machine to another, and it's a great script. I'm really enjoying it. Uh, if you have anything to do where you need to copy logins, copy SQL Server agent jobs, et cetera, et cetera, uh, from one machine to, a ne uh, to another, like if you're upgrading from 2012 to 2014 or just need to make a copy into your local or your dev environment, this is a great session to check out. And the session by Jeff Hicks, you've probably seen him before, great session. Uh, I always learn a ton from Jeff, and I begged him to do another session so I could learn more. All right, don't want to take up too much of Mike's presentation time, so SQL Saturdays around the world. You should check them out if you haven't already. Uh, here are a few of the upcoming ones, and like I said, Atlanta is coming up in a couple weeks here, almost exactly 29 days. Hey, and, Aaron? Yep. If I can interject about Atlanta real quick, if anybody is interested, I'm actually doing a full day... PowerShell, Intro to PowerShell for SQL Server DBA Precon at SQL Server Atlanta. Um, there's a sign-up page on that website if anybody wants to know more. Yep. And uh, so, yep, Atlanta, about four weeks from today. It's going to be crazy. We People have not um, managed to max out our registration limit yet, so you can actually register and not get on the waiting list. So if you're in the local area, great thing, uh, great thing to do. And uh, sorry, I've got too much noise going on in the background. And uh, if you're interested in volunteering at Pass, uh, Pass would love to have you. Volunteer.sqlpass.org, and that is it. Oh, oh, um, the links for those um, two webinars are in the email, and they'll also show up on SQLPass. Or sorry, PowerShell.sqlpass.org, but they won't show up until we finish this session today and close out of it. So uh, come back Monday or just go back to your email and you'll, you'll find the links to it. And that is it. Mike? All right. Let's see. I've got to switch presenter to myself. That is correct. And yes, I'm sure I want to make Mike fall the presenter. I don't know if anybody else is, but uh, here we go. All right. Uh, can you see my screen? Yes. 
Excellent. Excellent. All right, everyone. Well, thanks for coming out today. Um, you know, always like talking about PowerShell, and hopefully everybody's excited. Uh, this is a session that I put together. Uh, the thing is, is I've, as I've worked with people and talked to people about PowerShell, there's a lot of varying degrees of PowerShell knowledge. Some people know a lot. Some people know very little. Some people are just getting their feet wet. And uh, it's used, those people that are getting their feet wet that uh, I, there's a couple things that I've learned over stubbing my toes over the past two, two and a half years working in PowerShell that I'm like, hmm, I should pass this on. And so this session is, is just some gotchas and some cool things that I've discovered that I think will be helpful to people who are kind of getting going with PowerShell or maybe they've been going with it for a while and just weren't aware of something. So we'll go ahead and dive in on that. Uh, first off, if my slide will advance, there it goes. Um, the obligatory bio slide, uh, who I am, my name is Mike Fall. I am a SQL Server DBA and have been so for, I think at this point, about 15 years. Been doing it for a fair amount of time. Uh, I blog up at MikeFall.net. If anybody wants to read, I've been blogging actually a fair amount about little PowerShell functions and such over the past couple of months that I've been putting together and using. Uh, if people want to go see some of my techniques and some things that might be useful to them. Uh, I also blog about whatever else interests me, so maybe you'll see something else that interests you or you know, whatever. Uh, I am a Microsoft Solutions Certified Solutions Expert, which means I can pass a bunch of exams, and I'm on Twitter at Mike underscore FAL. Also, a quick note about my blog. Um, this presentation and the associated script file is already up there on my blog, so you, know, you guys are welcome to go download it. Uh, please get the script, play with it, mess around, see, you know, tear it apart. And that is part of the ground rules. Um, I don't want people to necessarily focus on the code here. There's, there's going to be some stuff, a lot of things I'm going to throw at you. You can pick apart the code at a later time, and I want you to. I think that's, that's actually one of the great things about learning PowerShell is, is diving into it and, and taking it apart at the seams. Uh, what I want you guys to focus on is what we're able to do and kind of the concepts and see, you know, what am I trying to get at and then later you can say, okay, well, then how did he do that? And then, of course, um, it'll be a little weird here, and Aaron's going to moderate the questions, but feel free, if you do have a question, to you know, put that into the question box and pass it along, and we'll uh, do our best to answer it. So what are we going to talk about today? You know, like I said, it's tips and tricks, but what specifically? First off, we're going to talk about the PowerShell pipeline. I think this is something, particularly for Windows people and SQL Server people who are not used to scripting, uh, and command line stuff, the pipeline is new and different and uh, not completely understood, and it's extremely powerful. So we're going to talk a lot about that and, and why it's such a key concept. Uh, we're going to talk about PowerShell and SQL agent jobs. It's one of the key ways to just get started with SQL Server using PowerShell. It uh, came around uh, in a recent version of SQL Server, and it's very, very useful. We're going to talk about the SQL PS provider. Um, we'll talk a little bit about how useful it is and where it's appropriate to use it, but it's kind of a good entry point into actually using, uh, connecting with SQL Server in PowerShell. We'll talk about some functions, PowerShell functions and the profile, you know, what, what are ways that you can package up and reuse your code. And then finally, uh, extending on that code reuse pit, we're going to talk about PowerShell modules and how you're going to write them and use them. So uh, with that, that's kind of the, the overall, you know, what we're going to talk about. And we'll just go ahead and dive in, unless I'm guessing nobody has any questions at this point. So the pipeline. What is the pipeline? Uh, again, if you've used scripting languages uh, up to this point, uh, maybe uh, batch file scripting or corn shell or batch shell scripting in, in Linux and Unix, uh, you're used to the pipeline. It's, it's the ability to extend a command out using the pipe character. And the syntax is fairly straightforward. If we look at this block of, of code that I have here at the top, where we're doing a dir C drive, and then we pipe, and then we do a where object, and then we pipe, and we do a select object. Well, this is, this is at its very basic sense, uh, how you can do anything in PowerShell in one line. Now, it could be very, one very long line, but it's one line, and it's that pipe character that allows us to do this. Now, dir c, we all kind of understand that, and that's essentially getting, you know, 
uh, getting the results of a directory lookup. And that's the th first thing that's going to happen in this particular syntax breakdown. We're going to do a dir C. It's going to give us all the things there. But then when we in, uh, use that pipe command or that pipe uh, character, we're going to take those results, and it's like passing it um, through a gate, over a fence. I've heard a couple different analogies. But basically, you're taking all those results from that dir uh, lookup passing it over that pipeline or through that pipeline to the next command. And, it, and the next command is this where object. Now, for people who may not be familiar with where object, it's like a where in a SQL um, statement. It's a filter. So what we're doing here is we're taking all those results from the dir C drive, passing over the pipeline, and then taking those and processing them to filter them where PS is container equal true. Um, some things to note here. The dollar underscore, uh, if you're not familiar with PowerShell, is a common character which basically means the current object in the pipeline. And the PS is container is a property because everything in PowerShell is an object and has methods and properties. PS is container basically says this is a directory. So we're looking, we're saying filter everything that is a directory under the C drive. Then we take that, and I apologize, I still haven't fixed this slide. It says show properties with where object. Actually, we're showing the properties with select object. Uh, select object is much like a select statement in SQL, where we're basically saying, show me only the name. So this whole big um, statement basically says, look up everything in the C drive, filter out everything but the directories, and then show me just the names of those directories. So with that, let's actually talk about some practical use and see some actual PowerShell scripting. So um, I'm assuming, uh, Aaron, again, just let me know if the text needs to be bigger. It looks, I, I think we're okay right now. But um, so we can use the pipeline in a very basic sense with one of what I call the three, uh, one of the holy trinity of PowerShell self-discovery, get member. So we can declare a string variable, much like we, uh, we would normally do in a script. In this case, I'm going to declare string Earl Grey Hot. But I can use this pipe to then pass it to git member and start to explore the, the values and the, the methods and properties of this object. So if I run this, and we get a bunch of stuff down here. I'm going to scroll up a little bit in the, the, bottom, uh, the bottom here. You know, by passing it, we get the output of git member of that object. So we get system.string. We get all the different methods. We get all the different, we get the one property, which is length. We can do a similar thing with the integer if we declare, and this comes to the explicit or implicit typing of PowerShell variables. You know, with this above statement, we did an explicit typing. This we're doing an implicit typing. But we're going to, you know, declare an integer variable and then do the same thing. Pass that over the pipeline to get member to see what our, uh, you know, we get our type for that variable, system.in32. And we get a bunch of methods. Actually, integers have no properties, interestingly enough. Uh, but it, it's a way for us to start, you know, we're just extending out the functionality and passing stuff over to these other commandlets. Now, the thing to keep in mind, again, with PowerShell is everything is an object. And it tries to figure out, you know, in general, what the object is when you declare it. So I'm going to run an invoke SQL command here using the SQL PS provider, which we'll talk about later. And we're just going to run a simple query for uh, select name recovery model description from sys.databases. But we're going to do the get member on this. Now this might take a little bit because I think it actually has to load the provider. I probably should have done that ahead of time. Nope, we're all done. So as you can see, now we have, because we're passing it this get member, now we have our system.data.data row type. And we have methods and properties. Um, related to that. Now what's cool about data rows is the properties are also the names of our columns. So this can be pretty useful and if you're if you're wanting to reference stuff directly out of the object. Now we can also use the pipeline to say we want to pass it to measure object. So we're going to do a measure object here and just see how many values we have in our data row object. And by running this, it passes this to the measure object commandlet. And we can see that, hey, we've got 13 rows in. I've got 13 databases. And if we wanted to do other mathematical functions in this measure object, we could. Now, this is all kind of, OK, this is neat. We can see what our different objects are. And OK, we can do some simple pipelining. 
But let's get a little more fancy and try to be a little more useful. Now, one of the things as a DBA I'm always concerned about is what's the free space that I have on my drives? It's, it's a common problem. We're always watching disk space as our data files grow. Now, I tend to use the uh, get WMI object, the Win32 volume, uh, to measure this. This is kind of a common script that you'll find out in a lot of blog posts on the web. But um, this is where the pipeline really starts to, to be useful to us. Because what I want to do is I want to get all the Win32 uh, all the, the, the values in the Win32 volume for your, uh, the get WMI object call, but I need to filter it because I only want drive type equal to three, which is uh, runs within uh, di you know, logical disks. And this includes both regular drives and mount points, and this is why I tend to do this in PowerShell. So we want to filter on this drive type, so there's our first pipeline action. But then I want to do some sorting. I want to make sure it's sorted by name because I, you know, I can't assume I'm like like I'm used to running select queries. I can't assume what my order is, so I want to make sure I have my the order that I want. So I'm going to do a sort, which, you know, is a, a, across another pipeline. And then I want a nice formatted output. Now this is again one of these points. I don't want you guys to focus on the code. Come take all this apart at a later time. But essentially what this does is I'm doing a format table call to give me a nice grid output. So when we run all this, this gives us a nice sorted output of the drives on my, I'm using a surface here, so it's not much to it, but we can see quickly you know, what the name of each uh, volume is, the label assigned to it, so my recovery tools, recovery image, windows, the size of it, free space, and percentage. All with this one line. This is, while I break this out on a different line, this is essentially one line of PowerShell. So that pipeline really starting to flex out the functionality, give us some, some robustness to how we can build our commands. So that's all well and good. It gives us some, some neat ways to build some reports. But what if we actually wanted to do things? When we start talking about free space, um, we need to talk about, hey, uh, what if I need to delete old backups? You know, how, do I, how can I leverage the pipeline to clean up these files? Uh, particularly, like, if we're on a drive, and we've got a whole bunch of different files and we only want to get rid of certain ones. This is where PowerShell really can, can help us because I can delete all the files I need with pretty much one lot using the PowerShell uh, pipeline. So for example, if I wanted to delete, let's say I wanted to delete my transaction log backups that were older than three days. I want to keep the last three, but if anything were older than three days, um, I want to get rid of those. Pretty simple using the PowerShell uh, pipeline. I can do a directory lookup where my backups are. I can pass it over this pipeline. And then I'm going to do my filter here, where object. And I'm going to say my extension is equal to .trn, because all my transaction logs are .trn. And the last write time is less than, and this is a little bit of funky syntax, but essentially all I'm saying is get the current date and subtract three days from it. And then I can pipeline it to remove item. And I'm using the what if flag, because I don't really want to delete these files. It's only for the example. But with this one line, I can, I can quickly go through and delete anything on my drive or anything in this folder that's a transaction log backup that's older than three days. So we can run that. And what you'll see is, is hey, it's going to delete all these transaction log files. Now, I do have like a, a couple full backups in there. We're not going to see any of those in this. It's only targeting those files that are older than three days. So that's really cool and very effective. Now what is additionally effective about using the pipeline is if we think about it in terms of whenever we're doing maybe in our databases a massive update or a massive delete, what's the typical trick? To run a select first, to say, I want to make sure I'm going, to, I'm going to pull back all the data I think I'm going to be affecting and just make sure I'm hitting the right number of rows. Well, we can do this in PowerShell using this pipeline because if I wanted to see just the files that I want to delete before I actually try to delete them, I can run everything up to this last pipeline right before I do remove item. If I run this, as you can see, it gives me a directory lookup of all those files, the names of them, their last write time. And then, so if everything's looking good and I'm getting the right uh, pull from my directory lookup, then I just have to add pipe remove item and it all gets deleted. So some effective use of the PowerShell uh, pipeline. Now we're going to see some more of it because it is a key concept. Hopefully you can 
see uh, effectively how, how this can really help you in just doing day-to-day -day commands. Uh, with that, uh, before I go on to the next section, Aaron, are there any questions to this point? Is Aaron there? No questions so far. No questions. All right. Okay, so let's talk about the PowerShell uh, and SQL agent. So with uh, the with SQL 2008, I believe, it might have been 2008 R2. I have to go back and just double check that. But either 2008 or 2008 R2, they added the ability to uh, create a SQL agent job that has a PowerShell script in it. So this is, this is really, I think, very cool because, I mean, there are other, I mean, we've always had the Windows task scheduler and we can put scripts in there and, and all sorts of calls. But as a SQL Server DBA, I use the SQL agent as my primary job scheduling device. You know, I schedule all my jobs in there. I run everything from that. It's, it's just a place that I know that I can go to and rely on. So with this, Using the um, the agent, using PowerShell in the SQL agent jobs, I can extend my functionality to running these PowerShell scripts and anything that I build to do stuff, and I don't have to worry about okay now I have to manage my jobs in Windows Task Scheduler and the agent and and have all these different uh, job scheduling uh, items. So it's it's just kind of a really easy way to to integrate PowerShell with your management of SQL Server and start to combine the two. So we'll just go ahead and dive back into the scripts with that. First thing I want to do here is do a quick cleanup of this directory. Yes, all, yes, all, yes, all, yes, all. Yes, all. And um, just get everything in kind of a current state. So if we go look at this, I just want to make sure that you know that there's, we're going to be putting stuff into this folder, but right now it's empty. So one of the things with backups in SQL Server backups that is always kind of a concern is the fact that we need to, like the best practice is, is that you back up your files to a different, to a, a file name that has a time date stamp in it and that you only keep the last few. Now there's a couple things in here that SQL Server frankly sucks at. And one of that is doing string manipulation for naming files. And another of that is, is file system management. That's really what I like to use PowerShell for is cleaning, as we saw with the, the pipeline example, cleaning up those old backup files as well as um, getting you know, nice named backup files with, with date time strings in it and getting everything kind of dynamic. So usually I have a PowerShell script to do a lot of this stuff and by having the uh, SQL agent I'm able to then implement that as a, as a, SQL, as a regular SQL Server task. So let's just kind of walk through how we would do this. I can use PowerShell to get a list of DBs using invoke SQL command and just doing select name from sys.databases where database ID greater than four. Fairly simple. Now if I want to get a nice date string format for my file, I can use this get date with the dash format. This is a whole lot easier than using SQL Server and using like date parts and you know, just it's a mess in T-SQL. I, I try to avoid it. But next up, then if I want to do like backups of each of these databases, using this logic, it becomes a simple for each loop, where I can loop through each name, database name in my database uh, collection. And then I can have this, this is where the kind of the path stuff becomes cool. I want, let's say for example, I want to have a separate directory, subdirectory for each database to backup in. Again, file, SQL Server sucks at file system manipulation, and if that path doesn't exist, then it starts to, it breaks. Things will break down on us. PowerShell is very good at this. So I can use PowerShell to say, okay, well, I've got this directory that I want to make. I want to have the C backups as my root, and then I'm going to have, um, as I'm parameterizing the database name, I want to have a database, a, a folder specifically for this database name. And I can, in PowerShell, just say, okay, well, I'm going to do a test path. Does that exist? And if it doesn't, create it. Pretty straightforward stuff in PowerShell. Again, if SQL Server, I, honestly, I'm not entirely sure how I would go about this. But then, you know, going on, I can say, well, let's give it a nice file name where we have our database name and our date string. We'll, we'll make the backup path, the full backup path name with the, 
with my C backups database name and then this using join path. And then I create a simple SQL statement that's backup database of the database, you know, to the, the file path that we created with compression. And then I execute it using invoke SQL command. And then, because I mean, I'm still in PowerShell, I can use that, that similar command we were looking there and saying, hey, I want to delete anything that's star.bak in that directory uh, that is older than one minute. So basically, I want to get, I want to get, keep everything, I want to get rid of everything but the most recent pull backup. So this is a fairly straightforward um, PowerShell script. Uh, not, nothing too complex here, but what we can then do is let me fire up SQL Server here. I'm going to connect to my local instance. And if we go, ah, this is the other thing I almost always forget to do. Sorry, bear with me. I'm going to get Zoom it going. I always forget Zoom it. So if we look at the SQL Server agent. I have a job called Backup Databases PowerShell right there. Let's go in and look at it. And essentially, what I the PowerShell, uh, the job. This is like a normal job, but if we go into the steps, I have the PowerShell script step, and we can see that it is a type of PowerShell. The security for running this is still the SQL Server agent service account. So when we start thinking about security, it's not going to run as me. It's going to run as the SQL Server agent service. Or if you wanted, you could set up another credential within SQL Server to do it. But all I've done is I've taken that script that we saw in the ISC window and I've pasted it into here. And with this, now we have a, a SQL agent job that will execute our, our nice neat PowerShell script to back up all of our databases and handle all the file uh, system manipulation. So now if we go back to that C backups, you're seeing, hey, it's creating, it's created all, I mean, because these folders didn't exist before. We've created folders for each database name. If we go in, we have a backup with a nice name. Very clean, very simple. If we were to run it again, we would get our file system cleanup. So really cool way to combine PowerShell and the SQL Server agent to, to do your normal tasks, leverage the strength of PowerShell, but still stay within SQL Server. Any questions on that? Doesn't sound like it. No questions so far. You're all good. Excellent. So let's talk about the provider. Um, the provider is a funny beast. And, and Aaron and I were talking a little bit about it before the, the presentation actually began. So PowerShell has this idea of providers, and I'm sure if you guys are somewhat familiar with PowerShell, you've, you've seen some of this before, where uh, it treats different aspects of the operating system stack or the, the Windows stack as file systems. It's, it's a neat way that PowerShell has to allow you to kind of work with these different aspects as if they, as if they were like just a, a drive and, and with files in it, um, accessing things like the registry, um, accessing your aliases, as, accessing environment variables. So providers are, are very useful and very handy to kind of work within that shell environment. And there is one for SQL Server that gets installed when you install the SQL Server client. Uh, and then you uh, furthermore would install or import, like with SQL 2012 or better, import the SQL PS module. So it's, it's very handy. Unfortunately, one of the things that we do struggle with sometimes is it doesn't seem to be the best implementation for working with SQL Server, and there's some gotchas to it. But we're going to go ahead and walk through using it and how it can be effective for you. And then as you guys work more and more with PowerShell, you'll see where it's appropriate to use the, the PowerShell provider for SQL Server and where it isn't. So with that, I always wonder why I have that slide there, it's mostly so I can just have a picture to talk to. But we're going to dive right back into the scripts. So we already have the, the, the SQL PS module loaded. Um, but if you want to work with the prior, you're going to run this command. Let's go ahead and take a look. If we wanted to see a list of all our providers, we can just run get PS drive. And you're going to see when we run that, we've got 
an alias provider. We've got our C drive, which is a file system provider, a couple a function provider, a couple registry, yada yada yada. And then we have here the SQL Server provider. And so to access it, we're going to go into the root, which is SQL Server colon slash, right? Which we have right here at our PowerShell command line. Now let's start to work through it. Okay, what if I want to change directory? I've changed directory into it, and if I do a dir lookup into it, you're going to see, hey, we've got a bunch of stuff. It's as if I'm looking at a file system, but my, my directories, as it were, were things like data tier applications component, um, policy management, SQL Server database engine. See, so this is kind of neat. We're, we're actually starting to explore SQL Server, but as if it were a file system. This is really handy for people who are used to working in that command line environment. So now if I want to browse down into my actual instance, I'm going to change into the SQL data engine, and I'm going to change into my, uh, the name of my local machine, which is Xion. And if I do a dir on that, I can see my two instances. I have a default instance, and I have a named instance. Let's go ahead and now change directory into the default instance and do a directory lookup. And we're going to get a bunch of stuff that, hey, this kind of looks familiar. We've got audits, availability groups, databases. This is kind of some stuff that we would normally see in, say, um, Management Studio, right? All this stuff here, but we can access it from the command line. We can access it uh, running here just within the shell. <clears throat> so let's say, for example, we wanted to see what was in our databases. I'm going to do a directory lookup of databases. Now I'm going to use the force flag. And the reason I'm using the force flag is by default, the way the PowerShell, the SQL PowerShell provider is implemented, if we just do a directory on databases, it's going to hide all the system objects. I want to see my system databases, so to do that, we need to use the force flag. Now here's our pipe character. He's back again. We're going to pipe the output of directory databases because I want a nice output, and we're going to pipe this to a select object, which I use the alias select here, to get these values, and then we're going to pipe it to format table with an auto size. And that, so let's just go ahead and run that. And this gives us, real quick, just doing a directory lookup. Here's a listing of all our databases, when they were created, and how big they were in megabytes. Pretty handy, right from the shell, right from the command line. Now something I want to call out, we're going to use our old friend get member here. I'm going to do direct databases on use get member. Something to note, you're going to hear a lot about, okay, well, we've got the SQL PS provider, and we've got the SMO, which are called server management objects. The SMO has been around for a very long while, and it's a .NET library that allows people to interact and work with SQL Server. So the interesting thing about the PowerShell provider is, if we go back up to, and you'll note there's a lot of properties and methods for their databases. This is because the type here is SQL Server Management SMO Database. This is just something to kind of key in on is the SQL PS provider is built on top of the SMO. So all very well and good. We can start to manipulate things using the, the shell and using these SMO objects. So let's say I want to get a collection of all my logins. I'm going to do a dir lookup of logins and put it into DB login. Now, one of the things I like to do is set my default database to tempdb. I can use this collection now to loop through each login and set the property of the, the default database property of each of those logins to tempdb or to other, another db if I wanted to. So if I just do a dir, uh, a dir lookup of logins, we'll see that we have all these properties. Actually, let's... Never type in a demo, but I'm doing it anyway. Select name, comma, default database. So if I run this, we're going to see right now that, hey, I've got everything's already currently set to tempdb, but if I wanted to change it, let's say I change it back to master. I can use this collection now, go through each one. We're going to run our directory lookup again. And hey, they're all back to master. So real handy way for us to start manipulating things. We could normally do this. Yeah, there are ways to do this in T-SQL. But if we're working in the shell, in the PowerShell, we have a good way to do it as well here. So now I'm going to change it back to tempdb. Nothing up my sleeve. 
There we go. So that's all now tempdb. Pretty cool. Now let's do some other neat things. Uh, I don't know how many people here use Central Management Server within SQL Server. This is a, a registry that you can set up in a SQL Server that can manage multiple, you know, all the connections to all your instances in your environment. It's very handy. I'm a big fan of it. I've been using it for years. But because it's in the, um, the PowerShell uh, provider, it gives us a way to start accessing and hitting uh, different things across our environment with one simple script. So for example, I can do a directory lookup on my central management server that I set up. Now there's only one in here. This is my named instance because it's, this is my little laptop that doesn't have a lot on it. But imagine if you had like 15, 20, 30 servers set up in your central management server. Here they all are in this listing. Now that we have a listing, we can start to do some cool stuff. So I'm going to change directory back to the C drive. And we know I can get a listing of all my servers. So that's what this lookup is going to do using the provider. <coughs> back to my for each loop, I'm going to loop through each server and I'm going to create a backup command. And this is very similar to the backup thing that we saw earlier. But what I want to do is I want to back up, I'm going to back up each of my system databases for each instance to its own named folder. So I'm going to have a, I'm going to get a listing of all my system databases here with the database, with this invoke SQL command. Then I'm going to, you know, get my path name. I want my path name to be the server name, and I'm going to replace that slash with an underscore so I can have basically server underscore instance for each of my um, named instances that I'm going to create a folder for. Here's our test path again to make sure that directory is there. And then we're going to loop through each of these databases and back up each one within that server. So what basically this loop gives us a, a way to go through each server in our central management server and back up all the system databases. So we'll go ahead and run this loop. Actually, I'm going to do a real, I'm going to run this directory can't command first. You're going to note, so um, okay, this is here. You know, just to, just to kind of be thorough here, we're going to go to C, uh, DB files, backups, and then we will delete this directory. So that'll go away. And then we're going to run this. And with this loop, it creates the directory, and there, and it should be, let's refresh this. Uh-oh, my demo might just have blown up on me. <laughs> Where did it create that? Is it created? It's creating it. Uh, I apologize. Let's just double check here. Back, oh, I'm sorry. I'm in the wrong folder. I went to the wrong place. I'm a bad person. So there's our folder that we created, and there's all the, the system database backups that we just created. So using that central management, this is a trick, and if you go up to my blog and see some of my posts, that central management server lookup in the, the provider is a real easy way to execute things quickly across your environments. Uh, so highly recommend doing that. That is it for the provider. Again, a real easy way to get started using SQL Server and PowerShell together. Uh, as you work with it, you'll find the limitations, and you'll start to see where other uh, options are more appropriate. Uh, any questions on that? Nope. All right. None on that, but we did get one question. I'll just go oh. ahead and interject it now. Yeah, that's fine. Um, best practices for execution policy in PowerShell? Um, that's kind of a tricky one. Um, I tend to use, so you have a couple different options. You have, obviously it starts with restricted, uh, there's remote signed, and there's unrestricted. Uh, I tend to go with remote signed just because it kind of protects me from being dumb. Uh, if I take a, a random script and I, it makes me double check and make sure, hey, do you really want to run this? But, um, you know, I know plenty of people who just say, look, set it to unrestricted and, and just, you know, be smart about it. Um, 
you know, that's, I don't know how I feel about that. I tend to, like I said, I tend, restricted, I'd be perfectly honest, I've never found a useful case for just keeping it at restricted uh, because it just seems to be too difficult to work around and it, it puts up too many roadblocks. If you have a highly secure environment where you really want to be careful, uh, you can leave it at restricted and that should be fine. But I think uh, remote sign is probably the best way to go. Uh, I have, yeah, I'd agree that remote sign is probably the best way to go. And I would go so far as to say, unless you've got a reason to go unrestricted, don't. Yeah. And an easy way to find out if you have a reason is to leave it at, at remote sign. And if you hit a wall, now you know. Yep. I would agree with that. All right. Cool. Yeah. Cool. Uh, hopefully that answers that guy's question. Um, so I'm going to go ahead and move on. I, I noticed we have about 20 minutes left, and I, I'm probably going to have to go really quick here. Uh, so reusing your code. Uh, it's, one, it's all well and good for us to write scripts and do stuff in the shell, but we want to be able to reuse our code effectively. And when I got started writing PowerShell, you know, I was doing scripts, and I started parameterizing scripts, and I was like, oh, this is cool. But it was when I found functions that I was like, oh, this is, this is the stuff. This is the stuff right here. So what we want to do is we're going to, like, our scripts are our tools. And we have, you know, SQL Server DBAs. I have all my SQL Server scripts, things I take from job to job. And PowerShell is turning to be the same thing. But I want to put these tools into a toolbox. I want to make them easily reusable for me. I want to be able to say, oh, okay, I'm just going to take the toolbox and I've got the same set of functions and scripts within that toolbox. And this is really where functions can help us. Now, scripts we already should already know if you don't. Um, you can parameterize them. You can use the param keyword there and reference them in the ways described here on this slide. It's, it's the easiest way to say, okay, I'm going to take my script and reuse it. Um, I do it a lot. I still have a couple scripts. But it's one of these things to me that it does start to have its limitations and it does start to become a little clunky. Functions are kind of the next level of this. Functions we can declare and put them all in within a script and they start to become a lot more portable. What also becomes useful about functions is we can start to write our, our actions into smaller uh, pieces of code, smaller di discrete uh, examples and things that we're going to do and execute on and start to piece these all together in a larger um, script and a, a larger actions. We can start to build, we can turn our things into building blocks more than just, oh, I've got this script to do X and this script to do Y. Now, the cool thing about PowerShell that I like is I have it here on the bottom. So hopefully everybody's using Git Help. If you're not using Git Help, start using Git Help. And Git Help has so much information in it. And if you want to learn more about functions, you can use Git Help about underscore functions. Modules are kind of then, we, it becomes our toolbox. What we can start to do is as we write these functions, we can all put them into a module. And much like we have modules for failover clusters, we have modules for Active Directory, we have modules for the SQL provider, for the SQL server, we can write our own modules that have our own sets of functions. And we can start to import these and use them and hand them off to other people. Um, again, kind of the this slide kind of specs out more or less how you write them and where you're going to find them. What if you really want to learn more? Again, here's the Git help, and we can run Git help about modules and to show more about it. Now, a simplified version of modules is the profile. If you've used um, Corn Shell or Bash Shell before, you're probably familiar with your profile. It's kind of like a module, but what it is is a it's a PS1 file that you have that will load whenever you start up your PowerShell session. Now, there's a couple different profiles. Um, you can have a profile for your ISC. You can have a profile for the command window. You can have a profile that applies to both the ISC and the command window. It can be for you. It can be for everybody else. There's a bunch of different things. But what it does is it helps give you a way to kind of spec out how you want your environment to behave. And every time your environment spins up, it will execute this. And it also is a way for you to package um, package functions and other script commands into your profile so that they're always there when you start up. You can learn more by using Git help about profiles. So with that, we'll dive back into the script. 
scroll down here. Now functions, so here's an example of that free space, that, that get WMI command that I was using. But what I've done is I've created a function out of it called get free space. I have parameterized it where I can use a host name. I can pass it a remote computer name if I want. And by default, it's going to use the local computer name for this. So it's the same sort of output, but what this gives me now is now at the command line, because I've got it loaded, I can say get, and because I, it's a function here, I can, it gives me the IntelliSense, but I can run get free space, and here's my same output, but now I don't have to type all that other stuff or run that big long command line, I just have the one command. If I had remote computers here, I could then run the, the parameter to it. So I've got nice, a nice little package function that I can use. Now, of course, they can get fairly advanced. I have a function here that uh, you're welcome to go uh, look at on my, uh, on my blog. I'm not going to go through the detail here, but I've called it Export SQL DAC Packs. We use uh, SQL DAC Packs, SQL Server DAC Packs, at my uh, company to store our code, to manage our code, and source control it. Well, we also do schema backups by exporting those, the DAC packs for each of our databases. And I can use this function to scroll through and make a nice formatted output of my DAC packs. And it's all wrapped up into a function. So now if I want to run it, I can just say, hey, I'm going to export, I'm going to run my function, export SQL pack, DAC packs. I'm going to call the instances as localhost. We're going to run this, and it starts to export all my DAC packs. It's all packaged up into the function, and I can take it from one place to the other pretty easily. I'm going to go ahead and cancel that. Now, let's say I wanted to look at the profile. Now, the easiest way to edit your profile and to see where this stuff gets stored is if I run notepad dollar profile. And dollar profile is always going to contain the path for your local host's profile file. So we run this, we pull up our notepad, and here it is. And you can see, hey, there's my git free space function. There's my SQL log file function. Here's my export SQL DAC packs function. So what happens is, is every time I start up a PowerShell session, this profile runs. It's, a, it's just a .ps1 file. It's a normal PowerShell file like we would normally see. It's just got a special name, lives in a special place. And because of that, the host will always know to execute it and, and load all these functions when it starts. Very easy way. Now I'm going to skip all this stuff because it basically shows how I can shuffle the file around and we can create a new file. But you're welcome to mess around with that at a later time. I can use, so but I'm, you saw that I had an expand SQL log file. Because I put that in there, I can then access it uh, just from my command line. It's all packaged up. My tools are available to me. So let's talk about modules a little bit. Modules, I can see all my modules if I run git module list available. If we run this, it's going to take a little bit. You're going to see a bunch of stuff here, and you're kind of defining where, what each module is by where it's located. So these are the SQL Server modules. We scroll up. These are all the default modules that are supplied with PowerShell. At the top here, though, you'll note, so this is under... C program files, Windows PowerShell modules. And what this is, is these are all my custom modules that I've written that I use uh, from, day, from my day-to-day -day stuff that allow me to do stuff. So I have a restore automation module. I have a, I've got this from somebody else, set console font. But these are all modules that I can use to then expand out my own. These are all my own little toolboxes. So for example, I want to get, if I load the module SQL check, um, I actually don't have it here, but I can say import module SQL check. It's going to load it. And then I can say, okay, well, show me all the commands in SQL check. And I've got a couple different, I've got a test AG role, test SQL connection, test SQL connection SMO. It's kind of a work in progress. I've got a couple things I'm still working with that. Oh, there I imported it again. But because I've loaded that, now I have this test SQL connection, which is all this is is a simple select out to an instance name, but I can pass it a collection of instances and say, hey, can you just check and see if those are alive? And it runs a, it basically calls the, um, 
it, it queries sys.databases and gets the creation database of tempdb. So what I get when I run this, and this will take a little bit to run, and now I get an output of, hey, here's my instance name and the startup time. So I can see, hey, these started up yesterday. I started them up at a little before 8 in the evening. Now you'll note this has no startup time, so I know that this is this is not a valid server in the sense that it's not I can't reach it. Now I know it doesn't exist, but it might be one of those cases if you did pass it um, an actual valid server name, you say, hey, my server is down. I should probably do something about that. So we can have some fun with this. I'm going to skip this particular example uh, just due to time, but I basically wrote a little port scanner where I can say, oh, I've got port 1430. And, as, and for the, up until I hit 1450, I want to do each of these actions. And for each of these, I'm going to check the, the instance name and the port. I'm going to say, hey, can I connect to a SQL instance on there? And then I'm going to output all of that and say, it's going to show me, hey, you know, these are the ports within this 20-port range that, are, that SQL servers exist on. But let's actually go to this next example where I'm going to take my CMS server, where I, I'm going to use that same lookup, that central management server lookup stuff that we were talking about before, and I'm going to get all the servers uh, from my CMS into a collection. Now, one thing that kind of annoys me about the CMS, I didn't really talk about this before, but if you do a directory lookup on the CMS, it actually doesn't store the CMS server itself. So what I do here is, is I add the CMS server name to my collection. So I have a collection of all my servers, including the CMS. And then I'm going to pass that collection to this test SQL connection function that I've got in the module that I've imported. I'm going to run this, and what I now have is a really easy way to do a, a, a connection test on all the instances in my environment. So think about it is in CMS, you had 30, 40, 50 servers, all your servers in there across your environment. With this, um, with basically this function and these other three lines, you can do a connection test across all your instances to see what's up and what's down and how long they've been up. We could add some additional functionality here to say, hey, uh, this was the start time, so this is how long they've been alive. So this is how, like I said, the, the whole point of this is to see how you can write your, your code into functions and package those functions into modules or set them in the profile and have these reusable tools. It's tool building. That's what we want to focus on with PowerShell is to say, um, it's one thing to have scripts and work from the command line and all, but I want to automate things. I want to make my job easier. I want to make all this stuff faster for me. So I'm going to go ahead and I want to package this stuff up. So with that, I, any questions? Anybody, anything that people are wondering about? Things that maybe that weren't quite clearly explained? I know we went pretty quickly through the end there. Uh, no major questions. Just a couple people asking for the link. You had already mentioned that for the script. Yeah, so if you go to my blog here, mikefall.net, there's a presentations tab. You go to the presentations tab and scroll. I think I put it this one at the bottom because they're all when I've done these presentations. You will find a link to both the PDF of the of the presentation, and you will um, also see a um, you'll see the script file. Now, actually, um, I don't have it here. I'm going to open up another presentation real quick because I have um, there's a, I have a resource slide. I need to probably get it included here, but I would like people to see some resources that they can use to follow up on some of this stuff. Where is my documents? PowerShell, oh no, presentations. Um, let's go jump start because it's in here. Jump start. So um, I will actually try and get this resource slide uh, in, a, in a better version available. Some resources that I list here for bloggers and uh, online resources. But the thing I want to focus on is this right here is I have a GitHub repository where all of my PowerShell scripts are. Things that I'm working on, things that I've put together, 
They're all there. Uh, it's public. You're welcome to come and download them and make use of them. I mean, it's it's kind of your typical Creative Commons uh, attribution, non-commercial thing, where you're welcome to use my scripts. Just give me credit and uh, let me know if you're going to use them for something that might actually make you like actual money. Um, but it, they're all there. They're my script. They're, a lot of them are work in progress. But if you're looking for some PowerShell stuff to kind of pick apart things that are built primarily to be used to manage SQL Server, you're welcome to to check that repository out and see what's going on there. All right. Uh, just uh, one question from Lars. Uh, what PowerShell example uh, that most impressed your employer or clients? Uh huh. That's a tough one. Um, I think the most impressive thing that I've been able to do is uh, my previous job. You know, as a database administrator, we want to. Um, we want to always be testing our backups. So most of the time it's a manual process and there is value to sitting down and actually going through the restore process. But PowerShell is a great way to, to automate things. And so what I did, and you actually, if you want to go to my blog and do a look up on restore automation, I wrote this PowerShell module, because let's be honest, Restoring databases, particularly full databases with all the log backups, can get really tedious. And figuring out your log files. And there's a dozen scripts out there, but I wrote a PowerShell script that allows me to point it at a directory full of my, my full backups, my differential backups, and my transaction log backups. It will sort all of those files and figure out which ones need to be applied. Um, if I want to stop at a certain time, it will allow me to do that. But then it creates the SQL script to restore that, and then I can automatically restore that. And so we use that script to not only help us accelerate any sort of point in time restores that we had to do, maybe we were migrating a database or whatever, but it also we were able to package that up into a weekly process that would restore the database to a, a test server and then run a DBCC check on it and email us or log any errors that might occur. So that was probably one of the most impressive things. Um, I think the second thing, which is still sort of a work in progress that I'm doing at my current company, is we would take, uh, you know, we have to set up databases for our, our application. And initially that was a very manual process. I've been, implemented a lot of PowerShell and automation, and we've taken what was a, a process that would take us eight hours for one DBA to sit down and kind of go through all the steps, and now we can get our database for our application up and running from about zero in 30 minutes. Cool. All right. That's about all we've got time for today. Uh, like I said, everyone, we've got a YouTube channel up right now, and uh, you can go see our previous sessions. We'll get this one posted there shortly. And uh, please check out next month's sessions that we've already got posted, uh, or will be up there on PowerShell.sqlpass.org. And uh, migrating SQL servers with PowerShell and ISE tips and tricks next month. Uh, they're going to be great sessions. I'm excited to see both of them. And I want to do a quick shout out. Thank you to the uh, PowerShell virtual chapter for letting me talk, and thanks to you guys for coming and listening to me. I appreciate it. All right, thanks for doing the presentation for us, Mike. We really appreciate it. All right.